Persia, Greece, nor Rome knew nothing.
The Lord be with you. Welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church for this, the 12th Sunday after Trinity. Our liturgy shall be Matins. It's found on page 219. Just as a note, our Te Deum hymn this morning will be hymn 941. We begin with our opening hymn, hymn 846. Rise for Matins is found on page 219. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We now turn to the front of our hymnal to Psalm 146. We will speak Psalm 146, whole verse by whole verse, concluding with the Gloria Patri. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn.
first reading is from Isaiah chapter 29. It is not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest. In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom the darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the ruthless shall come to nothing, and the scoffer cease, and all who watch to do evil shall be cut off, who by a word make a man out to be an offender, and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate. And with an empty plea turn aside him who is in the right, Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall no more be ashamed, no more shall his face grow pale, for when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name, and they will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And those who go astray in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmur will accept instruction. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Chapter 3. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. O Lord, have mercy on us. The third reading comes from St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Deaf ears and silent tongues. 
These are the real and true easy effects of sin and the devil on these things. What more can be said about ourselves than the fact that we so often wish to plug our ears to everything and to stop our tongues from speaking? I'm not talking about two of those three monkeys with their hands over their mouth or ears with the captions of hear no evil or speak no evil or any of that mumbo jumbo. That's dumb. What I am talking about is how ears are plugged by sin and our tongues withering around in our jaws more like serpent's tails than a tongue. Just think about how we use our tongues. Think about how you use it. Is it for blessing or cursing? Speaking kindly to your neighbor or bad? When was the last time you allowed a hymn to be sung from your lips? And church doesn't count. When was the last time you used it in prayer with your children or your family gathered around you? Again, church doesn't count. I mean at home. Just think a moment how you used your voice and your tongue. Now how about those ears? Your tongue will only repeat what your ears hear. That's how my son does it. And every one of us, we repeat what we hear. So what do you stuff in those ears? Oh yes, we all know it all too well. It's the so-called news, news, news. Or movies, ridiculous video games. Or what is this new country rap stuff? You can only confess what you hear. Repeat what you hear. And trust what you hear. So where is the gospel? Scripture. God's teachings. What did you train your ears to hear over God's voice? And you might think what I say is harsh, and I suppose it is. You might have already turned yourself off to listening to me, and maybe you shouldn't have. God's word comes to you today, this very morning, and for you, for your children, and for your family. And you have already maybe stuffed up those ears because you refuse to listen. Listen to the gospel and to live the Christian life. But in today's text, Christ comes for you who are sinners and who are maimed by the handicaps of sin. So just look at this man. He's absolutely pathetic. He didn't even bring himself but was thrust in front of Jesus by the crowd. He couldn't even ask for help. He was literally helpless. So you can almost imagine the man on his knees in front of Jesus. And what does Christ do but take him aside? It's as though that Jesus saw him as who he truly was, a man who needed to be rescued. He took him aside privately, just him and Jesus. And that's what Jesus does for you too. Yes, he came for the world. He came for the salvation of all mankind. But he came especially for you. Yes, I know that even your ears are stocked up full of whatever you fill them with this last week or even a lifetime. Yes, I know that your tongue is tied by whatever you have trained it to babble on about. But this is what Christ does for us in the opening of our ears and the loosening of our tongues. He takes each and every one of you aside and puts his fingers into your ears and he touches your tongue. In these few actions, Christ has shown you by what pains he has taken to win your freedom. All that you filled your ears with it's cleared away, unobstructed. You hear the words, I forgive you your sins. And with but a little water, he pours on your head the redemption won for you on the cross, poured over you in your baptism. If Christ can do all of these things and two little actions of loosening tongues and opening ears, 
then what of that he has done for you on the cross? Where mouths are truly trained to confess, truly this was the Son of God. And you hear Christ say that it is finished by his last dying breath. In Christ, deafness is open to hearing the gospel. Muteness is free to talk like the gospel, to confess it, to live it, to believe it. The cross is left defining tongues, loosening tongues, and opening ears. Yes, you say to me, Pastor, this is all just easy. This is child's play. And yet I say in return, Ah, yes, even the children can understand this. But you, dear older children, do you believe this? Has this work of Christ become so much a part of you that you have trained your ears to listen to God's word above all else? Has his loosening of tongues encouraged you to pray often, to sing hymns, even if silently in your heart, to teach your children? Or have ears and tongues turned away from the gift and sought after foolish things? And now the devil comes out to play. You see, he even wants those of you who have been freed from sin, from condemnation, to return to his fold. Where Christ has opened your ears and loosened your tongues, that is where the devil would rather be, in your ears and pouring from your mouth like the foam that forms from a wild and rabid dog. What great and terrible things he can stuff those ears with. So what we need is nothing more than the power of the atonement. Christ taking on the corruption of all of our flesh. The sigh that he gives this man right before he heals him is meant especially for him. But it means that he takes pity on all of us, on the entire human race. Because Christ is interested in you he has mercy on you. And he desires to sanctify your ears so that you can hear the gospel and sanctify your tongue so that you can confess it. So to continue this work, God continues to do this in the power of the sacraments, especially in preaching. But I have to admit, it's become increasingly more difficult to listen to sermon, sermons these days. For you and me, we just don't have the patience to listen to God's Word if it isn't as flashy as YouTubers. We don't have the attention span to listen to sermons if it goes beyond the length of a commercial. And we certainly have forgotten how to listen to God's Word. But the kingdom of God is founded on hearing the Word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the gospel, reading the word, and hearing it preached. He who equips, sanctifies our tongues and ears to hear this word, to listen to his voice in preaching, and to have it redeem us by the gospel. And yet there's even more. Now that our ears and eyes, are, ears and tongues have been freed, there is more to be done in our entire Christian lives. He gives us this freedom so that we learn how to view the world, sin, life, liberty, our neighbor, and especially our counterculture. This is why we listen to God's Word, because He shows us our sin, the very sin that corrupts us to the core, that entices us, that harasses us. And He uses pastors, His sermons, His law to shut it out, to point it out, so that the truth of the cross may beam down as light and reveal you the truth. So listen up. And what of the world? It shouts all day long at you. It's all the so-called news. It's like a constant humming drone forever in the background. And what do you get out of it? But God's word pours into your ears like sweet songs. It trains you to listen to the truth. It tells you what is false and helps you understand what is true. 
And not only, but God's word enters your ears. And when it does, it comes out of your mouth to speak about life, the true sanctity of life, whether life is in the womb, out of the womb, near death, in our nation, or in Afghanistan, it teaches us about life and freedom from condemnation. But it also shows us the difference between the Christian life and the unchristian life. We are all concerned about the collapse of culture as we know it. Rather, should I say, as we choose to remember it. We worry and cringe and promise to help rebuild culture until it actually comes down to the fact that you actually need to do something about it. If you want to make change, then it begins with what you hear and what you confess. It begins in the home with you, with your children and grandchildren, your husband or wife, or whatever you might look for in a good boyfriend or girlfriend. It begins with what you choose to pour into your ears. And is it God's word? It begins at home, with the home of prayer, psalms, hymns, and using your tongues to be Christ to one another. Because Christians use their tongues and ears for Christian things. Don't speak of how the family is collapsing. If the word of God never enters their ears at home, or tongues never speak a word of forgiveness to one another. But make that your own in your house. Don't speak of how cruelty and hate spread among us if nothing but violence, ugliness, and crudeness are training us of what to listen for and to speak. But we pray that the cross won mercy would reign our homes. So take it up. It's all yours. All of it. The Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, your own baptisms, your Lord's Supper, your psalms, your hymns, it's yours. And it's a gift. So we pray for all Christians, for all families and homes, even yours, as unique as it can be, that we would be sanctified by the very water of the Spirit that pours in from the Gospel into our ears and on our tongues. The Christian life, the Lutheran life is certainly countercultural because it demands that God's word, his cross, his passion, his delight in your own good works, his instruction for your ears and your mouth be central in our life. So put your trust not in princes, our psalmist says, but put it in God who works to open your ears and loosen your tongues. As Christians, we must take back to the cross of Christ. If nothing else, we must return to Christ. We must long to hear him like we are Christians. We should hope to hear him as though we recognize our sin and need to hear his voice. And he will speak to you. Listen, and he will take his finger again. He will clear out the debris of sin so that his gospel may have its way with you. He will loosen your tongue and release it for confessing the truth, for serving your neighbor and teaching your family. Your Christ will still use his gospel to touch tongues and open ears. He will still work in the ministry and the church. The Lord, your Christ, comes to you and for you. May God be praised. Amen. We, raise, we rise to the Te Deum, hymn 941.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, by your gift alone, your faithful people, render true and laudable service. Help us steadfastly to live in this life according to your promises and finally attain your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that our ears would be opened by the Spirit to the gospel of peace and salvation, and that our lips would be show forth our thanks and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church throughout the world and for our synod, especially our district, that God would bless all congregations, pastors and agencies, to serve faithfully and without fear. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all pastors, that God would give them boldness to speak the truth in love and compassion, so they would not break the bruised reed, but rather lovingly care for all sinners in need of God's mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all in authority by whose service God provides for us in the gift of order, including parents and family, our government, our police and firemen, our military and our schools, that God would give them strength and endurance to carry out their duties for the good of those entrusted to their care. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, the frail, and the dying. For Jackson, Lucas, Kenneth, Hilda, Kim, Hannah and Brian, Bill and Judy, Richard, Jack, Judy, Charles, Alistair, Nettie, including all of our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan, that God would restore them to health and safety. We pray also for doctors, nurses, therapists, and all who tend our brothers and sisters in need, that God will bless them as they put the talents he has, God has given them to good use. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated for the hymn.
announcements, you may consult your bulletin, but I do have a special one for you this morning, and I come from uh, Pastor Kane and Anne, who are not with us this morning, but are actually are in Denver with her mom, Nettie. Nettie took a hard fall and was flown down to Swedish Hospital in Denver. She's very bruised and roughed up, but making progress to recovery. There is still some progress to be made, and the plan is to get back home to a re- for rehab, hopefully there in Nebraska. Pastor Kane and Ann continue to ask for your prayers and is very thankful for them. The Lord be with you. 